Okay. Okay, can you see it? Yeah, yeah, I can see it and I can see your pointer moving on the slide as well. So that's great. Let's try okay. the laser pointer. I saw your pointer. Now it's, there is, okay. Okay, here it is. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Luc. So the next um, uh, talk is uh, given by Jean-Luc uh, Lenners, and he's going to tell us about 40 years of the no boundary proposal. Um, so please go ahead. I will just uh, let you know five minutes before the end. That is so I'm going to be the end. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thanks very much to all of the organizers for, for letting me speak here. Um, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, in, in my talk, I would like to give a bit of a review of the no boundary proposal. So I will start reviewing the idea of the no boundary proposal and also the early works that have been done in sort of the first 30 years or so of the, the existence of the idea. And then uh, the end of or the last part of the talk will be more about recent developments in which I've also been involved. So in fact, the first mention of the no boundary proposal that I am aware of is from a conference in September, 1981. Um, that's why we're nearing the 40, 40th anniversary of this idea. Um, and this was a conference that was held at the Vatican in Rome. And it started with an allocution of the Pope, John Paul II at the time. And in his, and I'm translating here, what he was saying is that science by itself cannot resolve this question, by which he meant the question of the beginning of the universe. It requires the knowledge that comes from the revelation of God. So the setting was, uh, the stage was clearly set at the time, but then at the same conference, Stephen Hawking presented precisely his idea of, of how one should describe the early universe. And he said that, um, you know, it is difficult to define boundary conditions at the initial singularity. And even if one could, this would be insufficient to determine the evolution of the universe. This is because of strong quantum fluctuations of the metric um, when the curvatures are very large. And he says that in order to overcome this problem, it is suggested that one should adopt the Euclidean approach and evaluate the path integral for quantum gravity over positive definite metrics. And moreover, if these metrics are compact, then one does not need to specify any boundary conditions for the universe. So that's, that's the idea. Let me introduce it again in a maybe slightly different fashion. Um, in cosmology, you know, we always want to know what happened before. We, we, we are not satisfied. If we know what happened, you know, 10 years ago, we're not satisfied. We want to know what happened 20 years ago. If we know that, we're not satisfied. We want to know what happened, you know, a billion years ago and so on. So whenever you reach an understanding of a new phase of evolution, you ask what came before. Uh, but this could go on forever. This could be an infinite regression. And the idea of the no boundary proposal is that the geometry of the universe could be rounded off. And this would basically stop the infinite regression. It would also eliminate any initial singularity. Uh, and moreover, because of this, there is a possibility then that, this, that these are then the boundary conditions of the universe, that one does not need to specify any further boundary conditions. Now, the thing is that um, what is, you know, just rounding off the geometry of the universe does not work for a Lorentzian metric. For this, you need a Euclidean uh, part of the geometry. Then the idea was spelled out in great detail then in a very famous paper by Hartle and Hawking. Um, and let me just, from that paper, let me just take this starting point, which is the definition of the no boundary proposal. Say that the wave function of the universe should be calculated from a path integral which is defined to be a sum over metrics that are compact, regular, and Euclidean. Okay, that was the definition that they gave. Now, from this, there are some immediate consequences. For instance, the wave function for the universe should be real because it's defined over real Euclidean metrics. Also, from the beginning, the hope was that this definition was in fact unique. Um, and the definition was chosen in a sense uh, so as to represent the ground state of the universe. So we know that as we go back in time, the universe becomes simpler and simpler. And from this comes the idea that maybe the universe is actually in its ground state. Now you can understand this from time evolution in quantum mechanics. You know, if you have a time evolution, it's given by e to, e to the i e t, where e is some energy eigenvalue, or in, in general, the sum of such, um, such terms. Now, if you rotate, you vic rotate to um, Euclidean time tau, then you see this factor becomes e to the capital E times tau. And if you now take a limit in which the Euclidean time goes to the far past, only the lowest eigenvalue of E of the energy will survive. 
So in that sense, you pick out the lowest possible energy state by doing this integral, this Euclidean integral. Now also, as I will discuss in a moment, the wave function gives different probabilities for different initial conditions. And in that sense, it is really a theory of, of initial conditions for cosmology. A further consequence was that because the definition was expected to be over Euclidean metrics, you can then incorporate topology change. And in fact, Hartland Hawking discussed how this is encoded in the fact that the wave function of the universe should be non-zero when the scale factor is zero, because it is precisely at such locations where the, the lo where the universe shrinks to zero size where topology change occurs. Now, th this was sort of the starting point. There were some issues from the very beginning or some um, puzzles, I should say. Okay, so, um, let me just list three of these puzzles, which I think are particularly relevant. The first is that the pre th this uh, prescription seems to be a little bit in conflict with the uncertainty principle. Now, this is because if you sum over compact metrics, then you want that somewhere your metric shrinks to zero size. So somewhere the scale factor A should be zero. However, the Friedman equation implies that when A is zero, you need A dot squared plus one to be equal to zero if you want a regular solution. Uh, that means a dot squared is minus one, which means that really the derivative of a with respect to um, Euclidean time should be plus or minus one. So again, it's the same condition that you need a Euclidean part of the geometry. But you see what you are trying to do now is you're trying to fix both the field and its derivative at the same time. And uh, so it is not clear that this is actually um, consistent in a, in a quantum theory. Now, the second problem that uh, was there from the outset was the conformal mode problem. So if you look at the action um, for a universe with scale factor A and some matter fields phi, now you see that there is a kinetic term for the scale factor of the universe, but it has the opposite sign to all the kinetic terms for the matter fields in the universe. And so the action is in fact unbounded, both above and below. You cannot, you cannot bound it, right? And um, so, in that sense, it is not clear that the Euclidean path integral can actually be defined consistently because you have because the integrand now is, is unbounded. And the final um, puzzle from the beginning was the, this question of uniqueness, um, because early studies by Halliwell and Luco showed that um, in, in simple mini superspace models where you consider metrics which have only a few free functions. Um, there's a, a, a wide variety of boundary conditions and integration contours that you can consider. By integration contour here, I mean especially integration contours for the lapse function. Um, so for sort of integrations over the time evolution of the universe. Now, uh, therefore it was not really clear whether the definition would be unique or not. So faced with these puzzles, there was the early explorations of the no boundary proposal used a very pragmatic approach, which is of course typical for physicists, um, which was to just use uh, the saddle points of the path integral. So just focus on saddle points. The saddle points are the, the stationary points of the path integral. So they're the points where the action is stationary. And that means that you're looking at solutions of the e classical equations of motion. However, these solutions can be complex. Right? So really, in general, you're looking at complex solutions of the classical equations of motion. And these saddle points are thought to provide the dominant contribution to the path integral. Uh, now, the advantage of such an approach is that, you know, because you're just looking at, at classical solutions, um, you can fix both the field value and the momenta. So you don't have this, this issue of, the, of, of running, against the, running up against the uncertainty principle. Also, because you are not defining the integral, but just looking at, at stationary points, you do not actually need to worry about the conformal mode problem. And finally, uniqueness is only a problem if you have multiple inequivalent saddle points. And so first one has to see if that is actually the case. So let me just outline a little bit what the results of this early approach was. Um, the first result, important result is to, simply to show that appropriate saddle points actually exist. So um, uh, they, they have a shape which is a bit, which, you know, in, if you have an inflationary theory, the shape of these instantons is, is uh, such that the bottom part looks a bit like 
um, half of a four sphere, and the top part looks a bit like the uh, is close to the um, Lorentzian version of the De Sitter hyperboloid. Okay, um, the way these these saddle points are often represented is via some path in the complexified time plane. So I'm here showing the the plane of the imagine of imaginary time. And you see, you start from the South Pole, which is the bottom of the instanton, you go in a Euclidean direction. That's this red part, which is corresponds to half of a sphere. Then you go in the Lorentzian direction. And at late times, this green part, you get a, a, an approximately Lorentzian evolution. In general, in between this yellow part, uh, the geometry is, very, is, is actually complex. Uh, and this is for this reason, these instantons were called fuzzy instantons. Now I'm showing you an example here um, for a scalar field with a um, scalar field theory in a, in, a, in a potential that allows for inflation to occur. And what I'm showing here is on the left, uh, a plot of the scale factor of the universe at different locations in this complexified time plane. And on the right, it's the scalar field. And what this is actually showing is um, yellow colors simply mean some complex value. And the dark line in black is where the field value becomes real. So what this is showing is that really here from starting from zero in the Euclidean direction, you see there is a bit of a black line, which is just the sphere part. Then the evolution is co completely um, complex, but then at late times, there there's an approximately Lorentzian line along which the field become, becomes real. So you reach a classical universe at late times. For the scalar field, it's much the same, except that the scalar field turns out to be complex already, even near the south pole of the instanton. Okay, so these, these solutions exist. Now you should note that you have one such solution for one final value of the scale factor and of the scalar field. So if you think about the history of the universe, where the universe expands and the scalar field evolves, you need to consider a sequence of such instantons where the universe gets bigger and bigger. So for at each value of the, at each final value um, of the, each value of the scale factor of the universe, you have to calculate a whole instanton. Now, then there was an, an important result, which was, I think, first mentioned by, by um, Vilenkin, which is that when the wave function becomes of WKB form, so if you have a wave function, which is such that it has a, a phase that is varying very fast and an amplitude that's varying very slowly, um, then in fact, you get, first of all, you get an approximately classical history. So you get, so this sequence of, of, of final field values describes a classical solution of the equations of motion. And moreover, you can assign an approximately conserved probability, which is just mod psi squared to this history. Okay, so in that sense, you now get probabilities for different histories of the universe. Now, the question is, one question is, does the wave function automatically become of WKB form? And it turns out that that's not true. So it's not automatic that the universe becomes classical or that. So um, in fact, what you need is some kind of attractor mechanism. And the best understood example of this is inflation. So if you have inflation, then um, you, can, you can calculate that uh, the wave function becomes approximately of this form here, uh, where you have an, a weighting, which goes as e to the one over v of phi, where phi here is the value of the scalar field at the south poles at the bottom of the instanton. Um, and then there's a phase which goes like a cubed, a is the, af is the final scale factor of the universe. So as the universe grows, you see this, this phase um, grows in proportion to the volume of the universe. And so, uh, in fact, you get exactly the situation where you have an appro approximately constant weighting. If you have a slow roll so solution, for instance, then this V of phi is approximately constant. And then you have a very fast uh, varying phase. However, um, there, that's not the only possibility. It turns out you can also have no boundary instantons if you have an ekparotic potential. So if you have a scalar field with a negative and steep potential, um, you can also have such instantons. They look very different, however. So you have to take a different kind of contour in this complexified time plane. And what, uh, let me just describe what they look like. 
at the bottom, they are very broad. So they start again, like a sphere, but like a huge sphere, which is so, so the sphere would be so big as to look approximately flat. Then there is a big region where, this, where the fields are complex valued. And as the universe contracts, again, the fields become more and more real and you reach again, the Lorentzian um, solution of the equations of motion. Uh, in this case, the weighting of the wave function goes again as e to the one over the potential, except now it's the absolute value of the potential um, that, that, uh, that, you, uh, that determines the, the, um, the probability. Okay. In these models, of course, I should point out that um, norm after this contraction period, normally you get a big crunch. So unless you have a, a model which allows for the universe to bounce into a current expanding phase, um, these models would not give realistic universes. And at present, we do not know yet whether um, a bounce is allowed in quantum gravity or not. So in that sense, um, more work is required. So let me just maybe point out some, 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 um, uh, some of these consequences of these early studies. Now, I think one of the main things which, was always, which gets pointed out um, very often by, by Jim Hartle is that you know, the wave function can explain why the universe became classical. And moreover, it cannot become classical anywhere, um, but only in regions of the potential which allow for either inflation or acporosis. Currently, we do not know if there's any other mechanism that would work. Now, also, low values of the potential come out as preferred, which means that the no boundary proposal generically seems to favor short inflationary phases or long acporotic phases. And this has led to some tension with observations, right? Because if you want to explain the, the CMB via inflation, you need a, re, a long an inflationary phase which lasts long enough. Um, so some people have, have then used anthropic reasoning in addition to argue that the inflationary phase still must have been long in order to, to get a, a universe that is, um, you know, that, that can contain life. And also there have been arguments that, that in fact, once eternal inflation is included, then um, that would be the most likely the region to be. Um, I think this is kind of premature as I, it seems to me that uh, even though there is a heuristic way of associating a probability with a WKB wave function, there is no, rigorous understanding yet of really how to define probabilities um, in quantum gravity and, and in quantum cosmology in particular. And so I think um, that this also is something that needs to be uh, understood in more detail in the future. Now, another um, really nice aspect of the no boundary proposal is the following, that you can add perturbations to the geometry for instance, here I'm looking at tensor perturbations with a spherical harmonic of wave number k. Uh, the uh, tensor perturbation is denoted by h here. And you see this on the no boundary geometry, there are two solutions um, where one is regular at the south pole of the instanton at the bottom, and the other one blows up. So you have to choose the one which is regular at the, um, at the bottom of the instanton. And it turns out that that solution is precisely the Bunch Davies vacuum. So in that sense, the no boundary proposal automatically explains the Bunch Davies vacuum. You do not need to put it in by hand. Uh, and this also resonates well with the idea that it is describing the ground state of the universe. So it is also automatically describing the ground state of fluctuations in the universe. Let me point out one subtlety about this issue of perturbations, which is that because we are looking at complex solutions of the equations of motion, um, you see, if you have a complex solution of the classical equations of motion, then the complex conjugate will also be a solution. But whereas the no boundary solution has a weighting which goes as e to the plus one over lambda, where lambda is the cosmological constant, uh, if you take the complex conjugate solution, this is weighted by e to the minus one over lambda. So the consequences for, for observations would be very different. One, one can think of these um, complex conjugate solutions as effectively determining different Vick rotations, right? So when you go from real time to imaginary time, you have a choice of whether you turn to the left or turn to the right. And that's this choice that is expressed by these two solutions. Now this, however, has consequences for the perturbations because 
we know that from quantum field theory that there's only one direction of big rotation which actually makes the theory stable, which leads to Gaussian integrals. And that turns out to be the Hartle-Hawking choice. So if you, if you uh, take the Hartle-Hawking solution, then indeed the perturbations H here um, have a Gaussian distribution um, and an amplitude which goes as one over lambda as expected. And moreover, a scale, nearly scale invariant spectrum here uh, determined by K cubed. Now, if you take the complex conjugate solution, which in fact is the solution that is normally considered in the tunneling proposal of Vilenkin, then you get an inverse Gaussian distribution for the tensor perturbations. And so this leads to an unstable universe where large fluctuations are preferred. And in fact, it leads to an inconsistency in your whole setup um, because you've only now considered um, small perturbations, but now you find that actually large perturbations should be preferred. So your, your calculation ends up being inconsistent. Now this, um, this simple observation uh, turned out to be important in, in more recent developments to which I will now turn. Um, so one thing one can do and which was done a long time ago by Halliwell and Luco is to look at the mini superspace definition of the no boundary proposal. So you take, for, in the simplest case, you take a theory of gravity and a cosmological constant lambda and there's a particular parameterization of the metric, which is very useful, which is um, shown here. Uh, so what you do is you write the scale factor squared as Q of T, and you redefine your time coordinate to have this one over Q factor. If you do that, uh, what happens is that the action becomes quadratic in Q. So the, the action for the scale factor becomes just a quadratic action. And this has the consequence that you can do the path integral over Q now exactly because it is simply a Gaussian integral. Um, now the question is still, how should you implement the no boundary proposal? So the first thing one can try and do is to just say, we want to start at Q equals zero, meaning that we want to sum over compact metrics. So if we put in this condition, we ensure that we are summing over compact metrics. We can therefore do the um, integral over the scale factor and we are left with an integral over the lapse function n. This is a fairly complicated integral, but we can use a saddle point approximation uh, in order to look at it. Okay, so it has, it has four saddle points, which are all complex. And, um, and as I said, one can use um, a saddle point approximation and the sort of systematic framework for this uh, is called picard lefschetz theory. Now, what you do is you can look at the saddle points in the complexified plane of the lapse function and look at the steepest ascent and descent lines. The saddle points here are given by the orange points. There's four of them. Um, the uh, steepest descent and ascent lines are, are these black lines and the arrows always point downwards. So a steepest descent flow follows the arrows. And what I'm plotting here in green are regions where the path integral converges asymptotically. In red is are regions where the path integral diverges. And in yellow, it's in between, okay? Now, um, if, if um, we consider an integration contour over the real line of the lapse, meaning over Lorentzian metrics, then one can deform this contour by flowing it down uh, to this contour J1, which is a steepest descent contour and which passes only through the saddle point one. Now it turns out that that saddle point is one of the unstable um, tunneling geometry type saddle points. The Hartle-Hawking saddle points are numbers three and four here in the lower half plane. Okay, so we end up having a contour which is, comes out as, as being the only one that contributes. And it tells us that only this unstable saddle point contributes to the integral. Uh, which is a problem then for the no boundary proposal. Now, let me make some more remarks about this. The first remark is that, you see, we could not have defined the path integral over Euclidean metrics, which would have been imaginary lapse function values. Uh, because you see the, um, either if you take the upper half line, it, you, you run into uh, a region of divergence at infinity, or if you take the lower half line, you run into a region of divergence near the origin. In either case, the path integral just diverges and is mathematically meaningless. Now you could consider other contours of integration, but there is one feature here, which is always a problem, which is that 
you see, if you take, if you have a contour of integration, which picks up the saddle point four, for instance, which is a stable saddle point, there is a steepest descent line, which runs directly to the, to the saddle point one, which is unstable. So if you have a contour, which contains stable saddle points, it will necessarily also contain the unstable ones. And then it becomes unclear whether your path integral is truly well-defined or not. There has been a big uh, amount of discussion about this, and I refer to the literature if you are interested in this. Here, I, what I rather want to do is show you that there is an alternative possibility. The alternative possibility is to impose a completely different initial condition um, namely, to impose regularity and not compactness. So the regularity Sorry, condition... Just to let you know, you have, you have five minutes left. Okay, thank you. The regularity condition says that is a condition on Q dot. Okay, and this Q dot could be plus or minus I. That's again this choice of Vick rotation. If you fix it to be I, you, you fix it to be the ordinary Vick rotation, which leads to stable saddle points. So what happens in this case is that the unstable saddle points, which were up here, they have just disappeared. Um, and you're just left with the stable saddle points. Moreover, the contours of integration have, have changed and you can now have a Lorentzian integral, which just gives you the no boundary wave function. Moreover, at the saddle points, even though we, we impose regularity and not compactness, at the saddle points, the universe still starts at zero size as, as you wish. Okay, this, uh, let me, so another thing is that, another recent development is that it has become clear um, that this uh, no boundary integral actually is very, very closely related to integrals in anti sitter space where the cosmological constant is negative. So there also you fix a boundary now at spatial infinity or far or at some large spatial um, distance and you sum over interior metrics. Now it turns out that the, the condition which you need to put in the interior of the geometry in the ADS case is the exact same condition that we just put um, for the no-boundary proposal here, that, that, that was this regularity condition. It's the same condition that you need to use in the ADS case, which in fact then means that the ADS path integral is just the same as the De Sitter path integral, except that the cosmological constant has, has gone from negative to positive values. And um, you can now use ADS CFT to fi find out what the wave function should be. You know that, and you find out, you can look it up in the literature, and you find that it is given by an area BI function. What I, the consequence of this is that you can use analytic continuation now on this end result to go from a negative lambda to a positive lambda. And you see that in that case, this area function, this area BI function turns into an area AI function. And there are some consequences to this. In the ADS case, I'm plotting here the saddle points and the associated geometries. In the ADS case, um, the consequence is that only this n minus saddle point contributes to the path integral. So this is a saddle point in which the universe, as you increase the final boundary size, it just grows. There's a second saddle point which contains topology changing transitions and this does not contribute. That's what the, the CFT result implies. If you now look on the De Sitter side, um, you see that uh, in fact, the, the, the implication is that also it is only this N minus saddle point that contributes and not N plus. Now, but N plus is again, something which looks like a sphere when the universe is very small. Um, and this implies that in fact, there is no um, contribution from topology changing geometries, um, at least from simple topology changing geometries when, when um, the, the universe nucleates. There's a second um, consequence, which is that you see this saddle point, as the universe grows, it still remains Euclidean, but then there's a particular point at which it, it uh, becomes a degenerate saddle point, and then it splits into two complex conjugate saddle points in which the universe now expands and contains a Lorentzian part of the geometry. Now, this is known as a Stokes phenomenon, where you go from one relevant saddle point to two relevant saddle points. And this is precisely what allows time to emerge in this context. So time comes from, from this Stokes phenomenon. And I think this is an interesting mathematical um, observation that, that also deserves more study. I have one final um, point to make, which is that 
if you define the no boundary wave function with a momentum condition, with this regularity condition, then in fact, the no boundary wave function should satisfy the wheeler dewitt equation in momentum space at the moment when the universe gets created. And so um, here is the wheeler dewitt equation in momentum space. So this should be satisfied. But also you find that regularity means that this factor p squared plus 36 pi to the fourth here has to be zero. That's the same condition that you, you want the regular geometry when the universe nucleates. That means that at the nucleation of the universe, really what you want is that the derivative of the wave function with respect to momentum is zero. So this can be interpreted as saying that there's no momentum flow into or out of the universe when the universe is created, which then resonates well with the idea that the universe should be completely self-contained. There's a second way to interpret this equation, which is to note that this is nothing but the momentum space version of the condition that the scale factor acting on the wave function of the universe should be zero. So in some sense, this provides a, a bit of a reconciliation between um, you know, the zero size condition and the momentum condition. Now, in, instead of, of, uh, of summarizing what I just said, because the talk was short, I, I'm hoping that, that you will still uh, remember. Let me just point out some open questions. One I already mentioned, which is that I think that a rigorous definition of probabilities has not really been, been, um, been shown. Second is that at the moment, the no boundary proposal is mostly justifying assumptions that are otherwise made in cosmology. And this is from an aesthetic point of view and from a, you know, from a theoretical point of view, this is very satisfying that you can find justifications for otherwise arbitrary assumptions. But of course, in the future, at some point, what we want is predictions which are really testable. Um, also, all explicit models that have been considered so far have used mini superspace, and it would be interesting to try and see if one can go beyond this. A final point is that all of the studies that, or almost all of the studies that I'm aware of are in effective four dimen effectively in four dimensions. And there has been really very little discussion of, of the no boundary proposal in the full string theory context. Um, let me just mention one result here is that recently, uh, Caroline Jonas and I, we, we um, were able to show that if you add the expected curvature corrections, so Riemann to the n terms, then the no boundary solutions remain um, and do not get destroyed. Um, and yes, here I'm just flashing up a list of collaborators on the projects which I mentioned, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Luc, for this very nice uh, talk. Um, so we, we, have, um, we have, again, a few minutes for, uh, for questions. Um, so maybe I, I give priority to, uh, to people who couldn't ask their questions to uh, Enrico, so Tomas, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, I think I have multiple questions, but let me first, a quick one. I think I lost the thread at some point. So you gave an overview about a no boundary proposal. You mentioned the ambiguity between the Vilenkin choice and the boundary condition and the hartle hawking one. But then you seen, you concluded that all of this somehow didn't work in the end. Um, and you propose a new one, right? Where you put a regularity condition or you put a condition on the momentum. Yes. At the very end, you end up with an operator equation, if I cor correctly understand it, which is somehow like a quantum or an operator version of the original no boundary proposal. Is that how I have to see it? Yes, I think so. It's just that it's the same condition, but expressed in momentum space rather than in field space. Right, and but this is something you can do beyond uh, saddle points at the full path integral level. Yes, so this right. actually the, the full, um, so you can see that the, the, the path integral satisfies the wheeler dewitt equation in momentum space. So that's the full path integral, you know, not the saddle point that exactly. to the right. path integral. Exactly, right. And therefore but, I wanted yeah. to ask you, does, have you checked the conformal mode problem in, in this uh, case? Uh, yes, so we can see this from this, this. So for that, one does need to go in and do the saddle point approximation, but then you see that the con where, the, where the convergent contours of integration are. And it turns out that with this momentum condition, you can have an, an, um, uh, a well-defined path integral if you choose a Lorentzian contour of integration. So you cannot choose the Euclid, the sum of a Euclidean matrix as was initially 
proposed, you have to choose a sum over Lorentzian metrics. But so nevertheless, I understand correctly that because uh, the conformal mode problem was still there in the original uh, no boundary proposal, whether it was Vilenkin or Hertel Hawking. Yes. You're saying now with the momentum condition, you really can get rid of it. Yes. Right? If you go yeah. to the Lorentzian picture. Uh -huh. That's right. And the reason for this is that you see in, in uh, the Euclidean path integral, you have e to the minus s minus the Euclidean action. So this is an, and this is a real, you know, there's a real exponent in the fundamental definition. And this can be arbitrarily large, positive and negative. But for the Lorentzian contour, really you're summing over e to the i s. And so you have lots of oscillations, which, so then you only have a conditionally convergent integral, but then you can make sure that really this does converge. So using this picard lefschetz theory, you can transform this conditionally convergent integral into a sum of absolutely convergent integrals. But okay. then you are actually, what you are then doing, these convergent contours are really sums over complex metrics. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think, Masa, you are muted. Sorry, thank you. Uh, I was uh, suggesting Dean could uh, maybe step in and ask a question. Yes, thanks. Uh, just a quick follow up on the previous question. Um, beyond su mini superspace, if you have uh, lots of degrees of freedom uh, in your path integral, uh, do we know what the regularity condition uh, corresponds to in that case? Uh, I yeah, so um, it, it's basically, um, I know what it corresponds to, but I don't know how to construct the path integral. <laughs> that's, the, that's the short answer. So the thing is that if you want to impose, for example, a, a Dirichlet condition, so a condition on the, on the field value, then you have to add the york gibbons hawking boundary term to the gravitational um, action and in order to get a consistent variational problem. And if you, the thing is that for the no boundary proposal, what you have to do is to not add any surface term at all. Then if you look at the variational problem, you find that in fact, it allows you uh, precisely to, to fix this regularity condition. So, so the prescription is to not add any surface term. And this, by the way, works in any dimension, not just in four dimensions, but it works in all dimensions. And so, and, and this regularity condition, then uh, you can impose it and, and having no surface term fits well with the idea that there should also be no boundary there. Okay, um, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Luc. So maybe I suggest we can move on to the next uh, speaker, who is also the last speaker of this session. Uh, so Evgeny, do you, I call